This is Ingredient Insiders. I'm John Magazzino. And I'm Andrea Parkins. On each episode of Ingredient Insiders, we'll be talking with chefs, authors. And today we're even talking to the chef of a culinary academy, Andrea. Ooh. We'll then speak to the producer of that ingredient to learn its history, how it's made, and why chefs love using it in their culinary schools. Oh, look at you with that little riff. There we riff. go. So we're talking about cacao powder today, a.k.a. cocoa powder. Cocoa powder, yeah. And, you know, this is an interesting conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Do you, I, I, I'm just wondering, do you use cocoa powder or cacao powder at home at all? I don't typically use a lot of cocoa powder. I, I'm not a big baker. I'm definitely more of a savory cook. Yeah. Um, but I always find that cocoa powder is one of those ingredients that I buy for a specific recipe yeah. and then ends up sitting yeah. in my cabinet for a while. So I really, I'm excited to talk to chef Nicole Nodder and ask some questions on what else can we use cocoa powder yeah, for? He's the chef at the chocolate Academy. Mm-hmm. I think I really just, I, I need to learn more about this because I use cacao powder mostly for like dusting desserts like a home. garnish exactly i'll finish things with it and i guess i will also make hot chocolate from scratch with it mm-hmm. you know put it in with hot milk and and sugar add sugar and even sometimes some heavy cream wow you have fancy hot chocolate oh at your my house. gosh yes i'm a swiss miss girl oh are you really I no am. too watery no but you make it with like milk or you know, almond okay. milk, All right. and it makes it more I rich. Think, yeah, well, I'm going to show you a couple of things. I like. Do it you like thickened. marshmallows in your hot chocolate? No, I'm more of a heavy cream, whipped cream guy. Okay, yeah. fair. You? Yeah. I mean, I don't mind marshmallows. Yeah, no, them. I'm a marshmallow. I'm not, and, you know, yeah. I'm not an animal. Of course I like <laughs> marshmallows. Well, really looking forward to the cacao episode. Cacao. Cacao. This season of Ingredient Insiders is brought to you by Bazzini Nuts. Bazzini is the brand of choice among chefs in the finest hotels and restaurants. Their legacy of quality extends to gourmet retail stores, specialty boutiques, grocery distributors, and delis, ensuring you have access to their extensive range of consumer retail packages. It all started in 1886 when Italian immigrant Anthony L. Bazzini began selling nuts by the pound to bakers, street vendors, and individuals during the Great Depression. But Bazzini Nuts isn't just about peanuts. They offer a delightful array of nuts like cashews, almonds, pecans, pistachios, hazelnuts, and more, plus a tempting selection of dried fruit, including apricots, cranberries, figs, dates, prunes, and tomatoes. So whether at the ballpark, in the kitchen, or indulging in some well-deserved self-care, choose Bazzini Nuts. With a legacy spanning 137 years, they're here to serve your needs with the same consistency, reliability, and quality, making them an iconic name in the world of nuts and dried fruits. Bazzini Nuts, tradition, quality, and taste all in one. Taste the legacy today. This episode is in partnership with the Chef's Warehouse and produced by Gotham Production Studios in New York City. So we're joined today by Nicole Notter, and he is the head chef of the Chocolate Academy. What a cool job. What an amazing, yeah. Wouldn't you love to go home at night and tell people or meet someone at a bar and be like, yeah, I'm the head chef of the Chocolate Academy? Pretty cool. It's much cooler than it actually is, but yeah, I appreciate it. (laughs) We were talking a little bit beforehand. You're from Switzerland. Yeah, I was born there. And you grew up in the States. Mm -hmm. How did you get into the world of chocolate and cacao? Uh, Both parents are pastry chefs. Oh, wow. So I tell people that I really had no choice, but truthfully, I just got poor grades in school. And uh, both parents are extremely European, so I mean, I think, I'm not sure anymore, but uh, back then, when, if you didn't get the grades to go to school or college, you would get, do apprenticeships. Mm-hmm. And so when I was like 13, my dad was like, okay, what are you doing for the rest of your life? Because he knew I got poor grades. And I was like, I, I don't know. Are parents Swiss? Dad Swiss, mom British. Got it. And so at the time, my dad had a school, and he uh, asked me to come take classes for one summer, and then went down with it for the summer, took classes, and really just fell in love with it. And then, yeah, just uh, kept up with it. And then uh, by the time I was in 18, I graduated from the pre- uh, pastry program. But also, of course, graduated from high school and then was immediately in the industry. Where were your parents' pastry chefs? What kind of pastry chefs were they? Uh, both, uh, both teachers. Uh-huh. Yeah, so they had a school together in Zurich for a while. So cool. And then you guys know, maybe know Albert Uster Imports. Of course yeah. we do. So Albert Uster himself uh, asked my parents to come open a school up in Gaithersburg. Maryland? Yeah, at the facility. Got so it. So then they moved the school from Zurich to... 
Gaithersburg. And then, uh, yeah. Is that where you grew up? D.C. area. Okay. Until about nine. And then Alabama till 15. Yeah. Was that Whoa. all? Did your parents move because of the pastry world? Yeah. My parents split up and then my mom got a job as a, what's the right word? Like the head person of a culinary college in Alabama yeah. to like introduce the program. The dean. Like a dean, yeah. Dean, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah. So me and my sister moved with her down to Alabama. And then she got another job in Pennsylvania, so we moved back up to Pennsylvania. Did your I bet you did your mom make like the best desserts and like best chocolate chip cookies like when your friends, your friends came over yeah. and stuff? Or was yeah, she too busy? I would say soccer games are pretty great. Uh, <laughs> you know the cookies and stuff, the snacks totally. were always appreciated. Here are the macarons yes. at the soccer game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> two months of parry breast. <laughs> so you grew up in the world of pastry and chocolate. Yeah, pretty aggressively. Yeah, I feel like most of the guests that we've talked to, John. Like, my grandmother taught me how to cook. Or I have right. memories of my mom helping me stir on the stove. Like, you really grew up Yeah, I was making ice with yeah. my dad and, like, tempering chocolate. and That's pretty yeah. awesome. And now you're working with Calibo and Coco Berry. Yeah. Which, are they, are they the world's largest chocolate company? I believe so. I've, yeah, Berry Calibo. Sure that's correct. Yeah, yeah Berry Started Calibo. Started in 1911. And based in Switzerland? Uh, yeah, I think, mm -hmm. uh, yep. Belgium and France, Switzerland. Belgium. Yeah. Well, that's a different place. Is it Belgium? It's or Belgium. Yeah. Oh, they, based it's, in Belgium. it's based in Belgium so from my, yeah. my Googling. Good. This morning. <laughs> so based in Belgium and what goes on at the Chocolate Academy in New York? Uh, we do a, a bunch of different things. Um, of course, master classes, uh, demos, collaborations, innovation sessions. I think what I mean, I really love the demonstrations and uh, master classes. We had Ramon Murado, Jeffrey Kane, Albert Davey, a lot of really big chefs come in this past year. And then even for like the demonstration side, I like to only have really New York pastry chefs come. So we had like Kelly Nam mm -hmm. almost two mm -hmm. weeks ago, Sean Velez from Rashawn Daniel, he was there spring. Michael Esconas with mm -hmm. Boron and yeah. Ice came. Yeah. And then next year, yeah, we have uh, four more demos lined up with just New York pastry chefs. That I'm really looking forward to. Who's allowed to? Who's is this open to the public, or is it just for professional chefs to come and visit? Uh, Do you buy a ticket? How does it no, work? No, I mean we we make the demos. Uh, we try to make them free, mm -hmm. so it's kind of it's up to you if you want to come or not. Which I think is I think it's That's fantastic amazing. for wow. anybody listening to this yeah, podcast please come. can sign up and code to. All right, so let's talk more about this. So the New York. Why aren't we there right now? Instead of we're doing here a in this, we could like bring our oh, stuff. Oh, you're I, saying recording? Yeah, there. we should go to the school. Well, we will. Did you bring any chocolate with me? Yeah. No. All right. All right we'll have to go down. And yeah, get we'll have to go to the school. More so, reason to come. <laughs> let's talk about the Chocolate Academy. Where is it located? It's uh, Meatpack and District on 14th Street and 9th Avenue. And what are the days or hours that it's open? What's I'm there, going I'm on there all, every day? Is you're it in the Chelsea Market? Day. Yeah. Very yeah, cool. yeah, very close. Above the Gucci store on the corner there. Very nice. Oh, Andrew, you can do a little shopping and then go yeah. up and have some chocolate. Yeah, stopping at Gucci, yeah. you know, yeah. my favorite. Get a couple pairs of shoes and go <laughs> up. So these demos are going on how often? We're going to do four next year, and mm -hmm. I think we're having 10 master classes next year. And how many people does the, is it a like kitchen stadium kind of set up? Exactly. So demos, we kind of shoot for 40 people. Mm -hmm. But it's RSVP, you come if you want. I mean... I'll get more chairs, you know. Yeah. It really, I think it's a great opportunity for cooks in the industry, especially in New York, Yeah. to kind of meet other cooks and meet other chefs and also learn something. What's the website? How do people look this up? Chocolate-academy.com. There you heard it. Yeah. You know, I once went to see Jacques Torres in the late 90s do a demo. And I, t to this day, he did a few different recipes. I still, like, do and make those things at home. Like, he did some, like, candied almonds, some chocolate covered on, like all these things. Mm -hmm. I was so fascinated and loved it. So what are you excited about as far as the demos that are coming up? Uh, I think we just have a good lineup. Like Eden from Bread's Bakery. Mm -hmm. um, the babka. Yeah. Well, they actually, is that what he's going to make? It's killer. No, no, no. I saw photos he needs to make. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be really cool. Cool. Really, really cool. I can't release any more information, yeah, okay. but secret. You got to show up. Yeah, and we also have Kevin from the Plaza Hotel. Nice. Mm -hmm. It's a good friend of mine from years ago, coming to do a demonstration as well. Uh, Priscilla and Angela from uh, Grab Your Cruther, mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. going to come next year. I think it's just a cool opportunity to kind of give back to the New York first off chefs and also New York cooks. 
And then the classes, I'm really excited for next year as well. Uh, January is me and my father teaching together. Oh, great. So Have every, you ever done that before? Once, like a decade ago. Is he still active in the pastry world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he has three shops in Seattle area. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. We're going to be in Seattle in a couple weeks. I'm not going, but you should go. I'm, I would like to know the pastry shops because yeah. I would like to. Dote. 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 Dote in Seattle. Okay. Yeah. Very What's cool. your dad's name? Avold. Avold. Yeah. Very Swiss. Yeah. Right. Um, but how did you, I guess, kind of, you know, go from the pastry world and working, I guess, in kitchens to teaching in this? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um well, they opened the Chicago Academy, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. And I was always pretty active on social media, just kind of looking at what they were doing. I, I mean, I always just like kind of looked up to it. At the time, Jerome Langier opened it. Super talented chef. And then, um, yeah, I just, I always thought it was really fascinating and really cool what they were doing. And then, uh, I mean, of course, I didn't have the pedigree to go and work there at that time because I was still building my own resume. So just worked for different hotels, pastry shops, restaurants, and then also competed and then uh, I was living in Switzerland before here and then decided, okay, why not New York? And then found a job in New York, moved to New York. And then uh, one of the previous employees reached out to me and said, hey, we're opening the academy in New York. We'd like you to apply to be the head chef. And I was like, okay, I'll apply. And then like four months of interviews happened and then finally got the job and then was a part of the, the building process and the finishing project process. So yeah, we opened in April which I guess makes us at seven months now, which is just crazy because sometimes it feels like five years ago and it feels like yeah. yesterday. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's been a cool ride. It's exciting. It's very cool. Now, I know that, you know, we've done a couple of episodes on chocolate in the past and mm -hmm. this is going to be a little... A favorite subject. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't love mm -hmm. chocolate? But... I don't trust people who don't like chocolate. Mm -hmm. Is that okay to say I that? Yeah, I think it's, to be honest, I yeah, truthfully don't do you believe mean, So you're in this world. We talked about this before. Like, yeah. does everybody love chocolate? Yeah. Okay, I mean, there I you think go. So. You've heard it. Yeah, I think. But also, like, I think like, I think people love. I personally love milk chocolate. Me too. So I think that people like milk chocolate more. Yep. But people try to think that they're like cool or you know sophisticated. John I disagree with that. I yeah. love. It's okay. Milk this chocolate. is a safe. You here's what I'm going to say about this, and this I'm going to take this back to Switzerland. What? When I was in my late teens, mm -hmm. I spent close to two years living in Switzerland. And the Swiss, the predominant chocolate there is milk chocolate, right? You've got the Number great one. alpine yeah. grazing cattle. Uh, we were talking about hazelnuts earlier today. You got milk chocolate bars with hazelnuts, which I love. I would probably, and I'm not exaggerating, would go down to the local like shop and eat a chocolate bar a day when I lived in Switzerland. And it was always milk. As I've gotten older, this was many years ago, mm -hmm. I find the taste of milk chocolate just, I don't, I, I love it, but it's, it doesn't excite me. It's creamy and it's smooth and it's mellow. But if I want intensity of chocolate, I need to have something in the like 60% or 70% cocoa. Realm. Yeah, I mean, fair. That's give my, me, there, right, one I mean, hour. heard it from me. We heard you. That did, right. We listened. Does that make sense? It, I think it, listen, I think especially in the last, and correct me if I'm wrong, 20 years, like the, the higher the percentage people perceive it as being like better, healthier, a million things. Um, for me, it's. I'm not even talking about health. I'm just talking no. about like what you I want. The what I like. I want that yeah. intensity of flavor. For I don't me, like this. I listen. I don't like going. Seventy is my sweet spot. Mm -hmm. If I get above 75, 76 percent, you know, cacao, co cocoa content. Is it cocoa or cacao? Cacao. Cacao, cacao content. Nicole I am, taught me that. I'm yeah. not. <laughs> I'm not thrilled. Yeah, I don't know. I just I for me like it's just it, it becomes almost um like. Milk chocolate, it, it melts in your mouth. It's rich, rich and luscious, and I, I really enjoy it. Versus, I feel like when I'm eating like dark chocolate, I'm like, I have to like chew it, and you, it, it I don't know. For me, it's not as a uh, good of an experience. It's not as melt in your mouth. I like how it melts in my mouth, John. Okay, so there's nothing wrong Fair. with that. I mean, I think I think flavor is so subjective, uh, and I'm not going to argue with you, but just. I'm right, come to the I? academy. Am I right? So he's am I right wrong, or am I right? wrong? We're gonna am just I, call well, him I, wrong. I'm gonna say you're wrong, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna put you on blast. But come to the academy for one hour. I think I'm sure I can change your mind. Um, there, 
Accepted? What are you guys doing this afternoon? <laughs> I would love to come down. So let's talk. Let's dive into cacao powder. Is it cocoa powder or cacao powder? Cacao now powder. I'm confused. Cacao powder. Well, cacao. We, can talk, we can talk about this too. What is yeah. the difference between cocoa powder and cacao powder? Is, is, it, there is a it difference? Is it cocoa butter or is it cacao butter? It's cocoa butter. See? Yeah. That's fair. Nicole, talk to us. So with the difference like cacao powder and cocoa powder, there really is no difference. It's just their perception. Uh, it's what people, how they perceive the word. But there is no food authority in the world that says one way or another. It's it. just how people perceive it. Okay. And what exactly is cacao powder? How is it made? Oh, it's uh, this is a process. But basically, you roast the cacao nibs, then it goes through the shelling process, then it gets grinded, and then it gets uh, just processed. And then the cocoa butter is extracted. You're left with these cacao-like cakes, uh -huh. and then that's milled into a powder. What's the Dutch process that people talk about? Because I've heard you, mm -hmm. I've had chefs ask me. Yeah, is or it like Dutch al process? alkaline. Is it? Exactly. Let's so it's alkalized. Alkalized in Dutch is the same thing. It's okay. basically when you add potassium carbonate to the cocoa powder mm -hmm. uh, or the, during the process of making the cocoa powder, cacao powder. Uh, and it's just the, so it, the difference is, or the reason why it's added is because it reduces the acidity inside. So it creates more of a chocolate flavor that people are used to. Got it. it does also change the color a little bit. Does it make it like a richer color or a more dull color? More dark. Darker. Okay. I mean, you could say you could say both. Honestly, more of a chocolate color, like reddish and brown hues. Okay. Yeah. Do, will pastry chefs mix different types of cacao powders? Is cacao does cacao come in different percentages? Like, yeah. talk to us about the difference because mm -hmm. I, I'm going to say something. Usually, I know a little bit about something we're talking about. I really don't know much at all about cacao powder. It's a good day for you. It yeah, is. I mean, so we're learn a lot. So learning today. Yeah. We're releasing, or has have released five new cacao powders yep. to the U.S. market. So we've we had the Plain Arome, Extra Brut, the natu Nature, uh, Legier, and Noir Intense. Okay. So they're all a little bit different. And when you're talking about the percentages, uh, we're talking about the the fat inside the cocoa powder, cacao powder. So the fat is the cocoa butter, uh, and this of course changes everything. Mm -hmm. So I think the our highest Fat content is the plain aroma and the extra brute. Legier is super interesting because it only has 1%. Myself, I've never seen a cacao powder that had such a smaller percentage. Mm -hmm. uh, the nature has 10 to 12%, and the noir intense has 10 to 12%. So I think it's really, these are really interesting because the more you work with them, the more you kind of understand how the fat will affect your end product, um, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to like meringues or even like a brownie, because it's so many, such a different type of product. So there's a better cocoa cacao powder that you use for one or the other. Okay, again, interesting. pardon my laymanness on this. What are the no what's the number one use for cacao powder? Because when I feel like if I am baking at home, I'm usually using chocolate. Like you you're know, melting chocolate. I'm melting chocolate mm -hmm. typically. What's the difference between using cacao powder? You know, I use it for dusting things. And sure. But what is cacao powder primarily used for? Yeah, I mean, it's just to get a better chocolate flavor inside your products. I think if you add just straight chocolate, you're really adjusting the solids to liquids in mm -hmm. your in your ratio. Uh, especially like, so I can say, for example, when I competed in the past, we had to do a chocolate dessert. So we had, do you guys know what a gavotte is? No. no. It's a it's a tweel, but it's a, it's a really, really nice tweel. And so to make it more of a chocolate flavor, we substituted some of the flour with cacao powder. And just Got to it. kind of give it another color, intensity, and intense color. flavor. Yeah, cool. So, is cacao berry trying to get away from kind of the single varietal it's, cocoa powder and like kind of expand to say, okay, I'm making this. I'm going to use this cocoa powder, and I'm going to make that. I'm going to use something else. Yeah, I mean, hundred percent. Which I think is it's so needed. And what's cool for me is like getting to use these products more and more and more. Yeah. Even I'm changing a lot of my recipes I've done in the past to make more sense for the actual product I'm using. Mm -hmm. Like, again, if we go back to that fat content, uh, the Legere is 1%. So if I remember making a meringue-based product, I mean, what kills meringue is fat. So if I add, and I want to do like a chocolate d'aqua or a mm -hmm. chocolate macaroon, yeah. I can use a Legere 1% and it's going to keep the stability inside my product. Rather, if I use like, I mean, what I would do in the past before I knew any better would just be like a 22% fat. And be like, why is it collapsing? Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. Yeah. I think that's really cool. Like the way that we sell chocolate is typically by percentages. Mm -hmm. And when we sell cocoa powder, 
it's typically by brand. Mm -hmm. So which brand are you, you know, buying these days? And then we just send you that powder to really like kind of expand that and just say, well, what are you making? Because that's really what I think is most important um, versus just, you know, one size fits all. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Truthfully. Do you, are you making things at home with cacao powder? N not as much as I probably should be. I'm much more like you where I'm buying couverture and, and melting it and, and folding it into different pastry. Right. Um, but I'm learning a lot today. I know. You know, I was watching a video this morning and the person was making a chocolate cake on Instagram and she was melting the couverture. Then adding cacao powder into it. And I saw in two different colors of cacao powder. You know, one was, they were both brown, but mm -hmm. one was much darker, one was much lighter. And I was like, interesting. I like, I didn't know that people would blend the different cacaos. Yeah, powders. I think you can. I think it's just, it's more you get used to a product, the more you feel comfortable with changing these in and out. Like mm -hmm. our noir intense is super dark. I've seen black. Yeah, it's, it's basically black. Yeah. Uh, what is I, that used for? I mean, as simple as like, imagine. Well, I, like a black and white cookie, mm. even. Or okay, I have a question. Or something like an Oreo. This is a question for one of our sales reps. Her name's Jen Gordon. You're asking for a friend? I'm asking for a friend. I hope I have an answer. Okay. Black and white cookies. Mm. Is it a cookie or is it a cake? Uh, I mean, black and white cookies. It's a cookie. A cookie. It's a cookie. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to set the record straight that black and white cookies are cookies. Why does Jen Gordon think it's she a cake? She thinks it's cake. I mean, it's a very soft white cookie it's a cookie i mean what's I the definition very strongly of a cake then. a cake is like thick I mean, right there's a thicker cookie yeah so I'm, cookie. i just want to we're here with the the most expert person we'll to call john gordon after yeah. this okay. yeah i mean i think that like look at levon's cookies right it's still the cookie still a cookie oh. their cookies are like a meal yeah so good so good <laughs> yeah so where is cacao berry sourcing the cacao to make all these powders. Right. So cacao powder is a, is a product of chocolate or mm -hmm. cacao fruit. And we source all of our chocolates, just like everyone else does, across the equator, mm -hmm. like Madagascar or Mexico or West Africa. Um, and then it's all transferred to France and then processed in a production in France. Got it. So they're, they're kind of having relationships with farmers and ensuring that it's consistent and things like that? Right. Exactly. Got it. And I guess what else, what, like, what makes it unique? You know, why should a chef try this cocoa powder versus there's so many? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to, like, the consistency, the quality of flavor, and the, the varieties of different things you can, like, make or work with. I think also we have that, that natural new uh, cocoa powder, which is quite interesting. So there's no, there's no potassium carbonate added to it, so it has a very clean label. Uh, and then you can see the flavor. It's very much different. It's more like acidic and intensive, like dried fruits. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like if you say, like maybe the extra root or plain aroma has more of a chocolate flavor. I think it's just a. It's an interesting product to play around with. What should be like? What should we make? You know, what like if we're playing around, like entry level. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna buy some cocoa powder. What should I make? Mm. Okay. Good question. Okay, let's say you're gonna make a brownie. Mm. I'd go extra brute. Okay. It's it's very, high, I mean, super high fat, 22%. Um, almost like a fudgy type flavor, which I think brownie is mm -hmm. essentially that. Mm -hmm. Plain aroma, I think, has more of a kind of a caramel flavor, which I think if you're doing maybe like a chocolate biscuit to go into an entremet, that's kind of caramel flavors. It could pair very, very nicely inside. What about rolling truffles? Ooh. I think it's, a, I think you can go kind of any way you want. I mean, my most favorite extra brute. Mm -hmm. I really love that flavor. Mm -hmm. um, I love that bitterness that yeah, you get when I you bite into a truffle and you I get from the cocoa powder. Mm -hmm. It depends on, like, let's say you're doing a truffle, if, what chocolate are going to use inside that truffle? Like, if you're going with something that has really high acidity, maybe like... Cacao berry, obviously. Yeah, from, like, Tanzania, it's pretty high acidity. Uh, I think it's a... They don't, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I think it's <laughs> 70%, 75% maybe, pretty high acidity. I think that'd be very interesting rolled in the nature, nature because of that it, it's like acidity with acidity. Where if you're going with, let's say we have a chocolate that's 40% from Ghana, from cacao berry, rolling that in the extra boot, I think it'd be very, very nice to play around with. Mm. You're making good. me think of that demo with Jacques Torres because 
he candied these almonds and then tossed them in in cocoa, cocoa powder. Yeah, in cocoa powder and in cacao it, powder. Cacao powder, and it was amazing. Yeah, thought you were messing with me when you said cocoa powder. No, I I think I'm just so used to saying it that it's going to take some time. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think you're never going to be wrong. Right. It's up to you. But it's cacao berry. Only makes sense. Cacao powder. Yeah. So let's talk about a few things specifically. If someone is, a, you know, we have a lot of pastry chefs that listen. If they're making ice cream, mm. what cacao powder do you recommend? Uh, from what we've seen, the our cocoa butters with a higher fat content mm-hmm. usually lead to a better or a longer melting point, also like a better stable product. So again, that's plain aroma and extra brute mm-hmm. with the 22% fat inside. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned brownies. What about sponge cake if someone's making a, a ah. lighter, softer cake? Yeah. I, so if it's meringue-based, I mean, you could go... I always go with the number number one, the Ligier. Um, but Which I think is you're the 1% fat? 1%, fact. yeah. I, I mean, I was blown away when I did a Dequa with it. Uh, but I think you'd be fine going as long with uh, the nature. But I think it, it could be super interesting, too, because let's say you just love the, that extra root flavor. Maybe do like 20% extra root, 80% Ligier, and see what type of product you have at the end. This is making me want to like go I, and bake something right now. I need right to now. go eat chocolate cake like immediately. Yeah, I want to make something. Like I don't often bake, mm-hmm. but now I want to bake. Oh, well, I think I want to. Can we come down to the chocolate cafe? We would love and, like, to do, do that. Like, Let's like see. mess around. Yeah, I mean, uh, this week's a little bit tight for me, but next week <laughs> is definitely possible. Okay, that'd be awesome. But I think like it's such a it's so cool because, like with every product, the more you work with it, the more you understand it. And I think there's so many opportunities to learn from these cocoa or cacao powders, and gr- to grow and work with. Do you feel like this is like the next step in the or like the new thing? In the chocolate world, like I feel like there's, you know, kind of trends that happen in pastry and yeah, potentially. I think the the last trend we had was like really dark milk chocolates, which I'm still a huge fan of. Um, but yeah, I could definitely see cacao powder as being the next big thing. Yeah, see, so he looked at me when he said dark, so I didn't even know there was such a he thing. He said as dark, this dark, and then he looked at me chocolate. and said milk. No, but the, the so that's what he's talking about. If I could recommend, There's I want to really say really good dark milk chocolate. We do a, a Lunga, forty-one percent. Yeah, it's my most favorite. Okay, from cacao interesting. Berry. Say maybe I will I, I convert to, to the uh, milk chocolate. I'm to the the lighter side. <laughs> <laughs> What else um, do you kind of see trending in the in the pastry world? Uh, I think vinoiserie is huge right now, which is great because everyone loves Danish. I'm pretty happy that we moved away from these mousse-based cakes. And tr- I got so tired of seeing people glaze cakes, especially with these crazy colors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean... Like with like a mirror glaze? or yeah. Yeah. pretty quick and I, I feel oh, like... I think it's stuck around for like six years, six to ten years. But I mean, yeah. as much as I love Spring and Milk... And glucose mm-hmm. and chocolate together. Right. I don't love it that much. You know, it's just sure. so sweet. And I'm really happy that we kind of moved back to more of a natural side of pastry. Yeah. yeah. I feel like yeah. Scandinavian influence has been strong the last couple of years. Yeah, for sure. Right? I think in sweet and savory. Even. Sure. That's another, when you say savory, is cacao powder used on the savory side of the kitchen? It's a great question. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, I've seen it before. Uh, I was working at a restaurant called Frivo before the academy and our chef was using it uh with some with wagyu beef Mm -hmm. like he would so he'd go on one side then the opposite side and then sear it and i tried it and i was like i would never in a million years so he was dusting it on the meat yeah and then searing yeah i've seen coffee rub steak but i've never seen cocoa rub steak have you uh i have i have coffee cocoa yeah it was a first for me and i was like okay Yeah. yeah yeah I could see like the kind of the the depth that it would offer. Yeah, especially with game or, or mm-hmm. intensely fatty things as yeah. well. I was watching um, guys' grocery games last night. Do not judge me. Yeah, I don't even know what that Bri, is. Do you want Bria to edit that comment out of this or keep it on? No, but no, I'm kidding. Um, Richard Blaze. Yes. Was the, so they had like they had to do a three course meal in thirty minutes, and then of course guy throws them like a curveball, and they had to use. Uh, chocolate sandwich cookies. Is this a paid promotion for the no. Food Network? Okay, no, no, no. Just keep going. Sorry. They had to use chocolate sandwich cookies in every course. Chocolate Appetizer, sandwich Oreos. Cookies. Oreo. Okay, got it. But they couldn't say Oreos on the Food Network, but we can, you can say, say it here on Ingredient yeah, in- yeah. Insiders. So he, he, Richard Blaze was like, he 
I'm like, what's when you a talked about Scandinavian, cookie? he took the Oreos, blended it with pumpernickel, and then um, put it on like a smoked salmon. And it, they, the judges were like blown away by Wait, using chocolate so, in like this savory kind of. So he dish. took an Oreo, he ground it to. He, did he take out the soft center? Yeah, he, he took out the soft cookie? center. Okay. And then he blended it. He like uh, toasted pumpernickel uh, bread and he blended them together. Which I thought was like very interesting use of, and very I know creative. that Oreos they use like the black, mm -hmm. dark cocoa Sugar powder to make. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys like these TV shows? I guess you do since you watch them in your free. So time. the reason that I like that one, and there's another one that he does called Tournament of Champions, is that there's a they call it the randomizer. So he like spins wheels, and it it picks the protein, it picks the style of food, it picks the equipment you have to use, so it equalizes it, mm. and the judging is done blind. Uh, for me, it just seems a bit hokey. It also, like, I don't think it gives the best representation of what the actual industry is. Right. I agree with that. I think there's two sides. I think yeah. that's like competition cookery. Right. Yeah. Versus... But the thing is, and then we get these cooks that come in the industry that think that yeah. we're going to be making this all day. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, here's a scoop right. and six kilos of cookie dough. I think that's why culinary schools, you know, I was back visiting. I went to Johnson & Wales and I was talking to like their alumni guy and he was like, you know, enrollments down. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, you know, with like kind of in the 90s when Food Network was like kind of starting and you had Emeril and Rachel and whatever, like everyone thought you go to culinary school and you graduate and you go on television. And that's not the industry. Which uh, which campus? Providence. I'm going there tomorrow. Nice. Yeah, Were you uh... doing demo on Thursday, uh, back to back. For Very cool. 150 students and then teaching faculty on Friday. That's what amazing. You, what are you making in your demo? A fun question. So I'm doing like a PK mm -hmm. Um So doing that gavotte, that twill base, mm -hmm. and then like a very making my own pecan filling and then blending it, adding pecan praline, and then piping that over top of uh, roasted pecans with chocolate chips and a mascarpone chantilly. And then this aerated chocolate. So I do like a chocolate with cocoa butter, milk mm -hmm. chocolate with cocoa butter. Uh, milk chocolate. Milk Everything chocolate. milk chocolate. Into an ISI, like foam mm -hmm. canister. Uh -huh. And then I uh, dispense it into a container that's kind of an ice bath, mm -hmm. put into a vacuum seal, and then apply a bunch of pressure so that it pressures up. And then I press stop, let that chocolate set, and then break it up. And then you have these like really airy pieces of chocolate. Interesting. Which is cool. super cool because you can. Like you could, t it's, it's like you, you can, can handle pick it up. It. Yeah, you can handle it. But then when you put it in your mouth, it immediately it's dissolves. Wow. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. Do you, is it sounds like do you, is your pastry cooking and baking very Swiss oriented or is it more French oriented or is there uh, such a thing? I don't know these if days? it is. I think it's I think it's all a big blend these days. Yeah. I have to say. I mean, I think there's some things that kind of dictate one way or another, mm -hmm. but if you work for a bunch of European chefs, you turn into a European chef, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where do you see? pastry or the pastry chefs going in the next 10 years oh that's such a scary question i think uh i mean if you ask any chef right now they're all looking for cooks mm -hmm. and i think it's extremely hard to hire uh truthfully i'm pretty nervous about the industry going forward um yeah i think we talked about it before like you have these people that go to school thinking they're going to be tv mm -hmm. stars and it's like yeah. no this industry is very very hard and you know sometimes it doesn't have really the best quality of life and then so i mean i was i taught at Johnson & Wales, the Charlotte campus mm -hmm. earlier this year. And I, I was, again, like throwing, throwing to kids or students and I was telling them, it was like, you're going to know within the first few years if you actually love this or not, because it's not the industry to be in if you don't really love it. Um, what I hope is that this industry continues to become bigger and bigger and greater and greater and we get better benefits and better quality of life and X, Y, and Z. Uh, but in reality, I mean, I see, I see machinery being used way, way more. Mm -hmm. So you're nervous that the the work ethic, the level of dedication, or that pastries and desserts are all going to be pre-made and yeah, and well, I either I, defrost or reheat. I don't know. Kind I, of I worry that I got into because I love work with my hands. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I really love creating things. I'm most nervous about. Basically, the machines taking the jobs, which I mean, go for it. Like, get a chef cut, cut all the you know cakes you want to cut. Cause I don't want to do that job. Right. Sure. But I mean, like piping and all that hand skill 
that I think we're losing nowadays. I guess I'm nervous about, yeah, all these skills that I really enjoy doing slowly fading out because there's no labor to actually do it. You know, it's interesting you're bringing this up because I walked through the National Restaurant Show in Chicago earlier this year with Thomas Keller, Mm -hmm. the famous chef. And he said he also is very concerned about the entire restaurant and food industry because he's like, John, look at this machine. Look at this machine. They're doing all of the jobs that he and every other hundreds of thousands of millions of cooks and chefs did manually for years and let them learn and, uh, you know, to your point, use their hands mm-hmm. and develop these recipes and develop food. And, and it's now completely the future of it's very automated. Mm-hmm. And I could see that being very scary to anybody who's worked in a restaurant or loves food. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I try not to be a pessimist or anything, but I also like try to be a realist. Like, okay, like this is the reality. How do I adjust the reality? Right. How do I understand this is what's happening, move past it? And yeah, I mean, automation is fantastic. I think that people are going to lose a lot of skills. Mm-hmm. And like, I think that, I mean, most people can't pipe chocolate anymore. And like, that's a shame because it's a beautiful skill. And I think it's really pretty. But uh, I mean, I get it. I get it completely. And there's like, why me complaining about it is going to do nothing. Yeah, but I, listen, I think like anything, the top level products are always going to be made artisanally with care by hand, whatever you want to call it. And that I look at the innovation on a lot of things as very helpful. And I'll give an example, which is we're totally off base here, but there are pre-made pastries now like breads and viennoiserie, to your point, Mm -hmm. that are made in big production facilities, blessed, frozen, and then available for anybody to buy and to reheat at home or in their restaurant or bakery if they want to do that. And in some cases, I'm trying these products and they're better than what a lot of people are making Mm -hmm. at their businesses. Mm. They're not better than what Dominic Ansel is making at his bakery or what certain people are making. You know, they're good croissants, but they're not the same as the really amazing yeah i mean fine made product and i think yeah. you'll always have that balance and that there is some there's you know the technology if you will is helpful in some regard and to your point though you're losing talent of all these young people yeah i mean i will i mean i will give prop like i'm very nervous about losing pastry shops because like the labor isn't there and the cost of it cost is so high yeah. and it's not it's hard to see a winning recipe because it's just such a difficult business to manage. But like, I'll always go to La Cabra on the weekend because I really like the chefs there. Like Jared's great. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like the product they do there. Lise with Unji is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Bread's Bakery Mm -hmm. with Eden, it's fantastic. So like, if I'm enjoying this, I must imagine that there's a population that's also enjoying this and also like uh, respects the quality that's going into it. So I don't know. I just try to keep positive that like, if these places can survive... It must mean that they're surviving for a reason and that people are going to because they like going to it. Yeah, I think there's two sides. I think there's that kind of automation side that you're Mm -hmm. talking about. And then I also think that in the last, just in the last few years, and I think this is a product of COVID, there is an awareness of like what it takes to bake bread and what it takes to um, like make pastry. I see a lot more of my friends and, uh, you know, like people on social media who are like investing in, you know, they're they're doing the sourdough starter. Like, and I don't think as many people were doing that pre-COVID. Maybe it was a time thing, but I think now there is this awareness of like what really good bread, what really mm-hmm. good pastry tastes like. Um, and I I don't think people are ever gonna really go away from that. But I do think that from a labor perspective, um, we are gonna continue to see more labor savers out there because you can't find cooks that are that want to get paid minimum wage yeah. to and you know no benefits nights yeah. weekends etc and, and I, the technology's gotten better 100% so I, I do think we need to change the like i wish we could change the conversation to you know having a better you know lifestyle and and benefits and and better salaries for 100% for chefs. i just don't i don't know how that's truthfully possible i don't know either but i feel like we should at least talk about it i agree i agree 100% like i think that like i'm kind of glad to see the stodgers are going away Mm-hmm. But like that's how I got good at pastry. 
yeah. was working for free, truthfully. Yeah. And like that was the reality of the industry because that's like how you, if you want it, I mean, like everything, if you want to get good at something, you have to put the hours in. Yep. And uh, yeah, that's just it. It's but an interesting discussion. It really is. Well, this has been a really amazing conversation. I I know I learned a lot about cacao powder. A ton. And I also learned about your guys' love, in, in, incorrect love of milk chocolate. I'm not judging We're either of you. It's a very bold that's, statement. That's fine. <laughs> it's fu- we can still be friends. Um, but what I'm really taking away from this too is Barry Calibo and what an amazing job that they've done in the world of cocoa powder, not to mention chocolate. Mm-hmm. And that also they have this amazing chocolate academy in New York City that is open to anyone, mm-hmm. which is great. It's Listen, incredible. if you're in the restaurant world or not, and you're listening to the podcast, go online. Tell us again what the website is. It's chocolate-academy.com. Couldn't be easier. Chocolate-academy.com. I do want to say, like, as a, someone who was raised by Patriot Chefs, grew up in this world, I really take this job with a lot of like seriousness and care, and like, I, I truly value what the Academy can be for cooks. And so, like, don't ever be shy to reach out or even come by the Academy. I'm more than happy to host any cook that wants to learn more. Yeah, I'm really, I'm truthfully for the cooks of this industry. Love it. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Ingredient Insiders. Follow us on Instagram at Ingredient Insiders. You can find the products we've discussed on today's episode at chefswarehouse.com or at your favorite specialty retailer.